Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Casey. I'm the director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown University. And it is my job, first of all, to welcome all of you to what I think will be a, an amazing and, and robust uh, discussion. We're looking forward very much to Archbishop Tomasi's uh, lecture. I also want to recognize Drew Christensen. Uh, Father Drew is a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Center and has an appointment at the School of Foreign Service. He will be speaking, I'll be introducing Drew immediately. Uh, as soon as I'm done, I'll sit down. Um, but it's, it's my great pleasure to welcome Archbishop Tomasi here to Georgetown yet again. Uh, we have developed a, a deep friendship between our institution and your work, and we have nothing but love and admiration uh, for what you've done and what you're currently doing, and we're looking forward to uh, your address here uh, on nuclear weapons. I had the good fortune of meeting you back when I had a war different hat uh, in, in the United States Department of State, and <clears throat> you were just in the business of beginning to organize the new dicastery, and we understand we're very close, you're very close to uh, to being finished that launching work, and so we're very excited about that. And again, uh, I'm going to take a few moments and read your long biography. I'll try to keep it short, uh, but it's our honor to have you with us, and you are indeed among friends here, and we're looking forward to, to talking with you today and also with some of your events tomorrow. Uh, the Archbishop was born and raised in Veneto region of Italy and studied theology and was ordained a priest in New York in 1965. He holds a master's degree in social sciences and a doctorate in sociology from Fordham University in New York. He taught sociology at the City University of New York and at the New School of Social Research. He founded the Center for Migration Studies in New York. He established and edited the quarterly journal International Migration Review and most of his publications, books, and articles relate to migration issues. He served as provincial superior of his religious congregation, the missionaries of St. Charles Scalabrinians, an international community of religious serving migrants and refugees of different cultures, religions, and ethnicities in 32 countries and on five continents. From 1983 to 1987, he served as the first director of the Office of Pastoral Care of Migrants and Refugees at the National Conference of Catholic Bishops here in Washington, <coughs> D.C. He served as secretary of the Pontifical Council for the Pastoral Care of Migrants and Itinerant People, a department in the Roman Curia from 1989 through 1996. From 1996 to 2003, Archbishop Tomasi served as the Apostolic Nuncio to Ethiopia, to Eritrea, and to Djibouti, and as observer to the African Union, formerly the Organization of African Unity whose headquarters are in Addis Ababa. Uh, in September 2003, Archbishop Tomasi began his service as permanent observer of the Holy See to the United Nations and specialized organizations in Geneva and to the World Trade Organization, a responsibility he carried out until the beginning of 2016. Uh, one of the reasons he is in town is the celebration of the publication by Cambridge University Press uh, which is an extensive collection of Archbishop Tomasi's interventions, and it's entitled The Vatican in the Family of Nations. And I have already had the privilege of skimming this volume. I haven't had the time to read it, but this will be a landmark set of essays that scholars will be drawing on, I'm convinced, for generations to come. And it really is a landmark publication, uh, and I commend that volume uh, to, to all of you. Once he reached the age of retirement for Vatican diplomats, he began immediately last year as delegated secretary and a member of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace with the task of bringing that dicastery and three others into larger curial office that Pope Francis had decreed, the dicastery for promoting integral human development. This new office became operative in 2017 and Archbishop Tomasi serves as deputy. The opening sentence under the quest of peace in this collection of interventions that Cambridge has Press has printed begins with these words. Largely unknown to the general public, the activity of the Holy See in the field of disarmament, security, and arms control has had some considerable achievements. The Holy See had contributed considerably to an international consensus that nuclear arms should be banned and that the huge sums of money now spent on nuclear arms should be uh, provided to all in society, especially the poor, who have borne the brunt of those expenses over time. 
and Archbishop Tomasi has been a champion of this cause. At a conference in 2014 on the humanitarian impact of nuclear arms in Vienna in November 2014, Archbishop Tomasi observed, some positive steps have been made towards the goal of a world without nuclear weapons. The Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the original START Treaty and the New START, uh, which was passed in 2011. The Holy See, however, still thinks that these steps are limited, insufficient, and frozen in space and time. The institutions that are supposed to find solutions and new instruments are deadlocked. The actual international context, including the relationship between nuclear weapons, states themselves does not lead to optimism. The world faces enormous challenges, environmental problems, migration flows, military conflicts, extreme poverty, regular economic crises, etc. Only cooperation and solidarity among nations is able to confront them. So, Drew, let me uh, invite you to the podium now, but again, thank you so much for your attendance here, and Archbishop, we are honored by your presence and look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Sean. It's very good to be, uh, to be here with you and teamed up with you. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. We're delighted to have you here today. Um, it's a personal pleasure to introduce uh, Archbishop Silvano Tomasi, whom I've known for uh, more than 30 years. Uh, when he was still at the Bishop's Conference and I was teaching at the University of Notre Dame, he invited me to write a piece that turned out to be fairly long, and then a second one on the, the Church's teaching on migration and refugees. And uh, I think that's stood the test of time. I think that's still really some of my important contributions. But in 2013, I got a call from him saying he's putting together a team that was working on the question of, of, uh, uh, of nuclear disarmament and would I, would I be willing to participate in the drafting of a document with him. And since then, I've been with him and, um, uh, and other, other people in the Vatican, well, he's put on my case and have found lots of employment for me. So uh, it seems that every week I'm writing another statement uh, that's going to be delivered at the UN. But and the greatest, the greatest uh, privilege is participating in the, the negotiation of the Ban Treaty uh, this, this spring and summer, uh, something I never would have expected, and uh, uh, which, which treaty is being celebrated today at the United Nations for the day, for the, complete, the International Day for the complete elimination of, of nuclear weapons. So without further ado, let me introduce with greatest pleasure uh, Archbishop Silvano Tomasi. Good afternoon. Thanks for, to Mr. Casey and to Father Drew for the nice words. I said that now my cause of beatification is ready. <laughs> Allow me, first of all, to thank President De Gioia and Father Drew in particular, and all the friends here at the Georgetown University for the invitation to share some concerns and ideas. In our fragmented and conflict-ridden world, the search for peace and integral human development is a very daunting task. The two objectives are certainly linked together. Development, as Paul VI wrote, is the new name for peace. Thus, we must promote the conditions that allow peace to flourish. Disarmament becomes a priority. In particular, Pope Francis observes the ultimate goal of total elimination of nuclear weapons becomes a challenge and a moral and humanitarian imperative. But the work for disarmament is not an isolated duty. The Holy Father adds, achieving a world without nuclear weapons involves a long-term process 
based on the awareness that everything is connected within the perspective of an integral ecology. In Laudato Si, he made this statement. For this reason, the active presence of the Holy See in the international life has an articulate motivation to promote concretely a culture of life and peace based on the innate dignity of every person and the rule of law through a multilateral approach founded on dialogue and on responsible, honest and coherent co cooperation with all the members of the community of nations. In this multicultural service, the more numerous the obstacles and the difficulties in pursuing peaceful coexistence, the more urgent the need to reaffirm that disarmament is necessary even when the obstacles take on new identities. Last April 13, <clears throat> and a mountainous area and caves of Afghanistan occupied by Islamic militants, the U.S. dropped the GBU-43B, the massive ordnance air blast bomb, called mother of all bombs. It's considered the most powerful of all non-nuclear explosive devices, with a power equivalent to two-thirds of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima uh, to end uh, World War II. The Russian Federation claims to have an even more powerful device, nicknamed Father of All Bombs. <laughs> the development of conventional prompt global strike weapons is another cause of concern with Moab, the massive ordnance air blast bomb, they contribute to blur the clear distinction between weapons of mass destruction and conventional weapons. To add to this, the non-strategic nuclear weapons and the discussion of new program to produce small usable nuclear weapons are weakening the taboo concerning the use of nuclear weapons. These new weapons, for example, conventional long-range missiles, could also lead to misinterpretation with eventually catastrophic consequences. To counter these programs, some countries attempted to develop their own deterrents. Pyongyang is a case in point. But it is not the only one that raises concern on the proliferation of nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction. In fact, Pong Yang has replied to this bomb development with recent nuclear tests, the latest with a tenfold higher power explosion than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The explanation, the explosion created a magnitude of 6.3 tremors, making it the most powerful weapon Pyongyang has ever tested. It seems that since the end of Cold War, we have paradoxically witnessed a deterioration of security and stability on the world. Violence by individuals can be observed on a daily basis. But can we imagine the catastrophic possibilities of what one nation can inflict on the whole world if led by individuals with violent intentions? This possibility should be addressed as a realistic threat and not as an hypothetical one. Of the 15,000 nuclear arms possessed by the nine weaponized countries, around 1,800 are ready for use within minutes. 
clear evidence of the seriousness of the situation. Major nuclear weapon states, USA, Russia, China, UK, and France, are developing programs for the modernization of outdated 1980s nuclear weapons, while other countries, North Korea, Iran, Pakistan, India, and Israel, either are mastering technologies that allow them to possess nuclear weapons or to increase their existing arsenals. In this climate of international tension, other states attempted to acquire nuclear weapons, making nuclear deterrence, again, the military strategy, aim at discouraging possible attacks. Accidents or incidents are possible at any time. The death of Stanislav Petrov last May and his experience on September 26, 1983, are a strong reminder that safety and security of nuclear weapons are far from perfect. Proliferation increases the risk already too high. Geopolitical changes affecting a big po the big powers could lead an entire region into a nuclear prol proliferation with possible catastrophic consequences. Yet until recently, nuclear weapons were the only weapons of mass destruction not prohibited under international law in an extensive and universal manner. In trying to fill this legal gap and in the wake of the pressing advocacy from civil society, on October 27, 2016, the first committee of the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution <coughs> requesting the, conver the convocation in, 19, in 2017 of an international conference to negotiate a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. 123 states voted in favor of this resolution, 38 against and 16 abstained. The above mentioned conference took place in two rounds of negotiations, May, March 27, 31, and June 15 to July 7. A large majority of the international community, together with the governmental and non-governmental organization and institutions, has actively activated has achieved an important milestone in the treatment of disarmament questions when it concluded a landmark treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. The instrument was adopted on July 7, 2017 by 122 votes in favor, one against the Netherlands, one abstention, Singapore. A long time in the May, this was the, the culmination of 10 years of preparation. None of the nuclear weapons nations has participated in the negotiations. The treaty is in many ways an attempt to reaffirm and hold humanity to the highest universal ideals of a world of peace and justice based on law. It exposes the fundamental contradiction between nuclear weapons and the existing international system. The initiative began from a small group of countries, including the Holy See, in partnership with civil society, especially the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, and the using the experience of the international organization <laughs> and the international committees of the Red Cross. The treaty opens with the simple declaration that the countries adopting it are willing and determined to contribute to the realization of the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations. It reaffirms the crucial treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty 
It moves on to the first article that makes a critical step forward. It reads, each state party undertakes never under any circumstances to develop, test, produce, manufacture, otherwise acquire, possess, or stockpile nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. In substance, the treaty's foundation, foundational claims are that any use of nuclear weapons will be contrary to the rules of international law applicable in, arms, in armed conflict, in particular the principles and rules of international humanitarian law, and that any use of nuclear weapons would also be abhorrent to the principles of humanity and the dictates of public conscience. This growing international debate is challenging the doctrine of nuclear deterrence by placing it under sustained scrutiny from the ethical, humanitarian, juridical, and military points of view. It is not so much a condemnation of the mere use of nuclear weapons, but even of the threat of their use and indeed of their very possession. Significantly, the UN treaty affirms that each state party undertakes never under any circumstances to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. Article 1, letter D. It is, and it is foreseen, and it foresees the total elimination of nuclear weapons. The phrase under any circumstances is of the highest importance. In the wake of the actual discussions around the U.S. nuclear posture review, the debate whether there is a need of lower yield warheads, usable warhead, is a very dangerous one. The discussion is not new about non-strategic nuclear weapons. To lower the threshold for using nuclear weapons weakens the deterrence doctrine and leaders could be tempted to use nuclear weapons for tactical reasons. But in the nuclear field, nothing is tactical. Misinterpretation and escalation are very much likely, even unavoidable. Making distinction on a technical basis is a fallacy. The nuclear taboo should remain the rule. Reaction to the new convention are twofold. On one hand, the atomic weapon possessors see the convention as pie in the sky, an idealistic move with no link to, pre to present day reality. On the other hand, the civil society and the 122 states that voted in its favor see this step as a critical moment in building public, a public culture where peace and dialogue are the priorities in solving differences. Significantly, the treaty recognizes the importance of peace and disarmament education in all its aspects and of raising awareness of the risk and consequences of nuclear weapons for current and for future generations. The Holy See is a founder and member of the International Atomic Energy Agency and has always praised the development in nuclear technology while strongly opposing its development for military use. Following the decision of the General Assembly to proceed with the drafting of a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, even the Holy See was invited to participate. Since 1950, the Holy See consistently and without ambiguity rejects atomic weapons. Pius XII, so a long time ago, argues that when an instrument causes so much evil that it escapes completely human control, 
its use must be rejected as immoral. In 1963, John XXIII, in Pachamintaris, writes, Justice, right reason, and the recognition of man's dignity cry for instantly, cry out instantly for a, a cessation of the arms race. Nuclear weapons must be banned. A general agreement must be reached on a suitable disarmament program with an effective system of mutual control. In his 2014 First World Day of Peace message, Pope Francis was also very explicit. I make my own the appeal of my predecessors, he wrote, for the non-proliferation of arms for this men, this disarmament of all parties, beginning with nuclear and chemical weapons disarmament. He encourages all to work for a world without nuclear weapons. Many local churches are engaged in promoting complete nuclear disarmament. Pax Christi, other Catholic organizations, bishops' conferences are acting to support the ban. The day before the adoption of the ban, the, the last uh, ban treaty, Archbishop Jean-Claude Olerich, the president of the European Justice and Peace Commission, and Bishop Oscar Cantu, chairman of the United States Bishops' Committee on International Justice and Peace, issued a joint letter calling for European states to map out with the United States a credible, verifiable and enforceable strategy for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. A major contribution has been the pastoral letter of on war and peace by the United States National Conference of Catholic Bishops. The challenge of peace, God's promise and our response of back in 1983. The compendium of the social doctrine of the Church discusses the threat of nuclear war and affirms with John Paul II the necessity of disarmament, emphasizing that the Church's social teaching promotes a goal of a general balance and controlled disarmament because justice cannot be sought through recourse to war, especially in an age when war can end without winners or losers in a suicidal of humanity. The arguments emerging from Church's documents and statements can be summed up briefly in this way. A humanitarian aspect, the abolition of nuclear weapons is an urgent humanitarian necessity any use of nuclear weapons would have catastrophic consequences. No effective humanitarian response would be possible and the effects of radiations on human beings would cause suffering and death many years after the initial explosion. Prohibiting and comple completely eliminating nuclear weapons is the, the only guarantee against their use. Even if a nuclear weapon were never again exploded over a city, there are intolerable effects from the production, testing, and deployment of nuclear arsenal that we experience as an, an ongoing personal and community catastrophe by many people around the, world, the globe. This humanitarian harm must inform and motivate efforts to our law and eradicate nuclear weapons. Two, a security aspect. Nuclear weapons pose the direct and constant threat to people everywhere. Far from keeping the peace, they breed fear and mistrust among nations. These ultimate instruments of terror and mass destruction have no legitimate military or strategic utility, and are useless in addressing any of today's real security threats, such as terrorism, climate change, extreme poverty, and disease. 
while many thousands of nuclear weapons have been dismantled since the end of the Cold War, the justifications for maintaining them remain largely unchanged. Nations still cling to the misguided idea of nuclear deterrence when it is clear that nuclear weapons only cause national and global insecurity. There have been many documented instances of the near use of nuclear weapons as a result of miscalculations or accidents. An ethics and a law based on the threat of mutual destruction and possibly of destruction of all mankind are contradictory to the very spirit of the United Nations. We must therefore commit ourselves to a world without n nuclear weapons by fully implementing the Non-Proliferation Treaty both in letter and spirit. This is Pope Francis. Then he continues, but any why but why give ourselves this demanding and forward-looking goal in the present international context characterized by an unstable climate of conflict which in both in bo is both cause and indica indication of the difficulties encountered in advancing and strengthening the process of nuclear disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation. And he provides this answer. If we take into consideration the principal threats of, to peace and security, where there are many dimensions in this multi multipolar world of the 21st century, as for example terrorism, as asymmetrical conflicts, cyber security, environmental problems, poverty, not a few doubts arise regarding the inadequacy of nuclear deterrence as an effective response to such challenges. Three, environmental aspect. Nuclear weapons are the only devices ever created that have the capacity to destroy all complex life forms on Earth. It would take at least less than 0.1% of the explosive yield of the current global nuclear arsenal to bring about an agricultural collapse and widespread famine. The smoke and dust from fewer than 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear explosions could cause an abrupt drop <coughs> in global temperatures and rainfall. And finally, economic aspect. Nuclear weapons programs divert public funds from health care, education, disaster relief, and other vital services. The nine, the nine nuclear armed nations spent many tens of billions of dollars each year maintaining and modernizing their nuclear arsenals. Funding allocated to disarmament effort is my new school in comparison. It is time to redirect money towards meeting human needs. Pope Francis states the arguments in his message to the 2014 Vienna Conference and the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. <coughs> Spending on nuclear weapons squanders the wealth of nations. To prioritize such spending is a mistake and a misallocation of resources which would be far better invested in the areas of integral human development, education, health, and the fight against extreme poverty. When these resources are squandered, the poor and the weak living on the margins of society pay the price. In conclusion, I would try to summarize a bit. There is little hope that the new treaty will, at least in the short term, eliminate existing nuclear weapons. 
However, the treaty is an important step towards delegitimizing nuclear war as an acceptable risk of modern civilization and they create a strong moral imperative thou shall not use and possess nuclear weapons. The treaty promotes changes of attitude, ideas, principles and discourse, essential precursors to eventually leading to the total elimination of nuclear weapons. It creates space and means for a disarmament policy politics based on law, ethics, and democracy. Overall, the new treaty includes many fundamental principles in line with the position of the Holy See expressed during the negotiations and in previously negotiated treaties in which the Holy See played an important role such as the Anti-Personnel Landmines Convention the Convention on Cluster Munitions and 2000, the 2014 Vienna, Vienna Conference. It is driven by the humanitarian paradigm and hinges on the centrality of the human person through clear recognition of victims, environmental concerns, as well as the role of public conscience, the need for peace and for peace education. A key moral question remains in many minds. Do nuclear weapons foster security and contribute to genuine peace? Pope Francis in his message to the UN Conference on Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty negotiations in March 2017 eloquently answers this question. International peace and stability cannot be based on a false sense of security and the threat of mutual destruction or total annihilation or on simply maintaining a balance of power. Peace must be built on justice, on integral human development, and respect for fundamental human rights, and the protection of creation and the participation of all in public life and trust between peoples and the support of peaceful institutions and access, access to education and health and dialogue and solidarity. From this perspective, we need to go beyond nuclear deterrence. The international community is called upon to adopt forward-looking strategies to promote the goal of peace and stability and to avoid short-sighted approaches to the problems surrounding national and international security. This is the way proposed by Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who called blessed and children of God all peacemakers. It is the way of solidarity and love that makes arms unnecessary and security universal. Thank you. Um, I think our speaker is ready to take a few questions, so if you'd raise your hands and you, and I recognize you if you to stand to ask your questions, you can be heard. And please identify yourself, name, and some, uh, some association if you want, uh, either past or present. And then uh, keep yourself to one question, and we'll come back to you at the end if there's time. So the floor is open. Yes. Right here. Oh, yeah. <coughs> no, up, up, up here. Hi, uh, Archbishop. I'm, I'm Bob Moore with Fox Christie. Uh, the 1983 Peace Pastoral from the U.S. Bishops uh, made a point that Catholics in the military cannot uh, serve in a capacity that would lead them to uh, launch weapons of uh, indiscriminate nature, uh, nuclear weapons. Um, I wonder if the current uh, climate could be strengthened by the Holy See's reaffirming that proposition that 
uh, Catholics in the military must make it clear to their superiors that under no conditions would they issue or obey an order to launch strategic nuclear weapons. This is a very difficult <laughs> question. There is no simple answer because it touches the life and the conscience of thousands of people and uh, we need to proceed very cautiously in formulating a clear, universal, uh, universally applicable position. I am not prepared to give a, a clear answer to this question, but this is a, a, one of the most delicate points in this debate that needs to be reflected by people uh, doing ethical research and by people doing pastoral work because it involves both sides of the of of the of the issue i think we it's one chapter that still has to be written and on which we need to reflect and to develop further research beyond that i don't dare to move for now. Okay. There's a question back there. Yes. Well, I'm a general, uh, general slogan. I was at Columbia University when Rock about was only read there, and uh, um, and I, I, I go to John Carr's events at the District of Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, and also one of Pro Bound with the Organized for Action. I saw you uh, at a Christmas mass with your brother, Father Lydio. Um, I just tell them to say, it seems the most urgent priority for us today would be to ask the Holy See to address the question of, of the relationship of the United States and North Korea. Most of the American people don't want war with North Korea nor a declaration of war. And it would seem only sensible for us to continue our uh, peaceful coexistence policies between South Korea and North Korea between 1953 and 2017. But there's, there, there, I just want to ask what we think the Holy See could, could do on, on that issue. It seems to be the major. Uh, you know, security and disarmament or arms control question today. On the question of North Korea, mm -hmm. I will line up with the position of the bishops of South Korea who came up, came out with an official statement, all the bishops of South Korea, and I understand that uh, the government of South Korea is also on the same line, pretty much. That uh, what is needed at this point is not a rhetoric of war, but dialogue. We need to open up channels, making an effort, notwithstanding the apparent irrationality of certain policy, policy positions, to open a a dialogue and prevent violence, prevent conflict. It's a, a delicate moment where the political leaders are called to respond in a constructive and creative way, uh, especially if we look at North Korea, not s simply as uh, from the military point of view, but in the overall picture that uh, Pope Francis presents, the, the food need of North Korea, the possibility of negotiating uh, without imposing sanctions that affect only the people and sometimes don't change any policy on the part of the government most of the time. Uh, we need to frame the questions in the wider, in the wider approach. But the, the, mo the greatest effort that needs to be made is to open a channel for dialogue. Good. Yeah. Other questions? Please raise your hand. In the back there. Hi, uh, Alicia Sinizaku with the Arms Control Association. Um, the police played a, a key role in the treaty negotiations. Um, I appreciated your support. Um, uh, my question would be, um, what is the role that you see that the Catholic Church and these local delegations can play in pushing for the treaty's uh, universalization and also continuing to work for uh, eventual verifiable disarmament? The role of the Catholic Church? Yes. In, prom in, 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 
in promoting universalization of the treaty and implementation? Uh, the treaty is not the, the response to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 6, that uh, demands uh, total and verifiable disarmament, nuclear disarmament. But it is a, a big step in that direction and the base from which in the future uh, we need uh, to be to, to, to start from uh, to continue negotiations for bringing aboard also the nuclear weapons countries because if they are not part of the of the negotiation we will not achieve the ultimate goal of eliminating atomic weapons what a catholic church can do is to continue to educate continue to advance the argument and to deepen the argument why the old theory of deterrence is not valid why we need uh, to oppose these weapons because of the humanitarian consequences. It's an educational process above all, and there has to be a, a convincing process. In fact, one of the interesting aspects of this new treaty, the way it came about, is that it takes, uh, it democratizes the debate on nuclear weapons. It's no longer exclusively the club of the countries that possess uh, atomic weapons, but it is the civil society. Even NATO countries they didn't participate because they depends on the protection of nuclear uh, nuclear uh, arms uh, countries they have to respond to their own constituency the political leaders the constituency that demands or say why you have a different position than what the, all these countries have taken uh, so the debate is enlarged and uh, the role of the, the church, civil society should grow in this direction of creating a, a public opinion and educating him so that uh, a different approach is accepted. Steve? I'm Steve Kolecki. I work at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. I actually have a, a more of a personal question. Um, you know, when I was a, a child, uh, we grew up in the early years of the Cold War, and I remember, you know, us having drills where we would, you know, file down to the basement uh, for our air raid drills and so forth, uh, as if somehow being in the basement was going to protect us from nuclear attack. But one of the things it did, it, it made the threat real. And so I know people in my generation understand this threat. What signs do you see that younger people uh, are, I know they're very engaged in the environmental movement and very responsive to Laudato Si, but I'm just, you know, they, they don't have that same legacy. For them, the Cold War is something that was over long ago and they never experienced some of the reality of it. So I'm just sort of wondering uh, how do we get a, a next generation, or, or do you see signs that our next generation is really coming into this concern and issue? Part of the reason for pushing in the 2014, 2014 Vienna Conference, the idea of addressing with force the question of atomic weapons has been exactly this, that there has been in the public debate a lull there has been kind of uh, an avoidance of continuing the debate. The Cold War finished, some uh, weapons, in fact quite a few 
thousands of weapons were destroyed uh, but de facto the objective risk remained and a question of sensibilization needs to be promoted. Uh, John Paul II in a way had accepted the doctrine of deterrence as a temporary, he made very clear, as a temporary condition given the, the present circumstances. And as soon as the Cold War finished, he re-established with clarity the rejection of, the, of, the, of this approach. So, yes, uh, at least in my little experience, there has been a, a lack of sensitivity to this vital issue. We have moved to the de ecological uh, debate. We have uh, prioritized some other very important issues, but we need to include in the overall debate also the, the question of atomic weapons. Yeah. David Hollenbach here at Georgetown. Uh, this question of nuclear deterrence is morally and politically an exceedingly complex and multi-layer question. Um, I go back to the days when the U.S. bishops were arguing about it back in the 1980s about their nuclear weapons pastoral letter where the debate about deterrence was very strong. And you made the statement in your concluding remarks that the direction in which the Holy See is moved now delegitimates uh, nuclear deterrence. Now, the term delegitimate, it seems to me, can have two different meanings. One is to say, to be content with where we are now is unacceptable, and that we must move in a different direction. The other meaning of it would be to say, any country that possesses nuclear weapons now must immediately and totally get rid of them. They are illegitimate, therefore get rid of them. And that was the position held by John Finnis, Germain Grise, and Joseph Boyle in the early 1980s when they said the threat to use nuclear weapons by the United States against the Soviet Union then was morally un unacceptable because it involved an immoral threat. And therefore they said immediate unilateral disarmament is a moral requirement. Now, my impression is that although the Holy See wants to move away from this situation we're in now, it does not call every nation that possesses nuclear weapons today to simply abandon them. Um, at least, so the question of how does process relate to the demand of immediate action from a moral point of view is a very complex one. I think you can talk about the possibility of arguing that there's a moral requirement for a different direction in the movement of where we're going, uh, but that that does not necessarily mean that there should be immediate unilateral or total disarmament by every nuclear armed power today. I'm not sure how you think about that, but uh, when you said that this uh, the position of the Holy See delegitimates the doctrine of deterrence, um, I'm interested to know how you relate it to that process question versus the immediate disarmament now question. I start uh, the reasoning from the new treaty that clearly bans the use and possession of atomic weapons. So there is a base to say that the trend we need to adopt now is to go in that direction, the direction of eliminating all, right. all the weapons. The Church, the Holy See, has always insisted this is the way to go. 
but we need to have the conditions for a negotiations that is fair and that is realistic. Also, this other aspect needs to be ta taken into account in the equation in th of the process of going forward. So, realistically, we know that no country will eliminate completely all its atomic weapons because of this treaty or because we say that this is unacceptable. But if we keep creating a consensus in the world, in public opinion, in democratic uh, countries, creating a majority that moves in that direction, and favor negotiations that are controlled, fair, uh, and there are a series of qualifications that are uh, listed, then uh, we we hope to one day to achieve this object. Okay, mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Danny Hall from Soka Gakkai International the Buddhist Association. Um, the new treaty was successful because it was driven by the humanitarian perspective. And here in Washington, D.C., the discussion about nuclear weapons is constrained by uh, arms base, national security interests, and budgets. What is the role of faith communities and civil society to bring those worlds together to influence decision makers here in Washington, D.C.? I know Sokagakai has been working on this for a long time. And uh, <clears throat> it's part of civil society that uh, builds up this new culture that we need to move in this direction. How to influence the policy of a country is the, the Holy See is not going to zero in in a specific direction of one country but will insist on general principles and creating a sensibility and awareness on the basis of ethical reasons for taking a position. John, John Carr? See, we went to uh, my parochial school didn't have a basement. <laughs> we got under that. a desk. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're going to be a lot more effective. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Welcome back to Georgetown. I want to pursue an idea that uh, raised before. You made a point that the nuclear powers have not engaged at all in this new treaty. And the question is, what institution could reach out to them? And there aren't very many. And the Vatican is probably the only one. And Donald Trump was quoted during the campaign as saying, what good are nuclear weapons if you can't use them? And the impression was he would like to find a way to use them. But if you turn that around, then you could say to him, well, if you can't use them, why don't you get rid of them? Because you want to spend a lot of money in other ways. He says he has a wonderful relationship with Russia, or at least wants a good relationship with Russia. Uh, he wants to make deals. This is a deal that Ronald Reagan couldn't make or Obama couldn't make. Could the Vatican be the one to reach out to the U.S. government and the Russians, Russian and say, we, you know, we've been working on this treaty, but couldn't we have a conversation among you? The idea that the great powers were going to have nuclear weapons and no one else was going to have them, and therefore they'd run the world, is losing ground every day. So maybe, how do you start a different conversation with the leading powers? And could the Vatican be the institution that starts that? That's the job of good diplomacy. <laughs> uh, I got a call from the Russian ambassador the other day because we are preparing a conference on nuclear disarmament for November in the Vatican. And uh, the Russian ambassador said, why didn't you invite us? I said, I forgot. 
<laughs> that was a diplomatic answer. But uh, I, he was very determined to have the Russian point of view expressed at the conference. And they are sending Mr. Arbatov, who was a major negotiator in the past, a very competent fellow. So I um, was so surprised, and, and the reasoning, uh, I mentioned this because of what uh, John said, and the reasoning is, they want the, the argument that uh, in, of the Russian has been that uh, we are forgetting the strategic implication of the present moment in negotiating and concluding a treaty and against uh, banning all the possession of atomic weapons. Uh, but I come to the conclusion that we find ourselves in two different outlooks, fundamentally different outlooks. One group or one current of thinking sees strategic value in uh, taking into account the present military situation. So it is strategically reasonable to say if Russia has so many atomic bombs or Pakistan or India or whatever, then I have to have them just in case. But Pope Francis and the Christian tradition reverse the process. We have a strategic approach that is based on a comprehensive way of looking at human society, that we need to deal with each other not on the basis of force or on the basis of arms, but on the basis of respect for the dignity of every person, for freedom, for uh, solidarity with the people in need, and the solution of differences through dialogue instead of through conflict. So I would say the Holy See is making a serious effort to keep the door open to get even South and North Korea to talk to each other, and not only United States and Russia, that they can already talk to each other in some form. Yes, but it's one of the possibilities. The United Nations is supposed to be the ground for encounter of different traditions and different policies, but it's not always effective. I was seen a little while ago that this time just for one more question. I've already taken two since then. And I'm going to recognize John Varelli. John is my co-host these days for Archbishop. Uh, and uh, before that, I want to just point out a couple things. One, the treaty is still is open to signature. As of this morning, there are some 40-some nations. I know when I was checked for the Pierce or maybe Dave Coppola, I'll check to see whether it reached it. The 50 is a number which the treaty will enter into force. Secondly, the treaty at a couple of places points to civil society and says civil society helped bring us here. They, they were in the humanitarian uh, consequences movement and, it, and they in fact participated in the negotiation <coughs> and therefore made a contribution. We want them to continue to be with us, be welcomed in subsequent review meetings and in the implementation. So now that the civil society role is encouraged both by the church and by, and by, a civil, by the UN. Um, uh, the other, the other, the other point that, that I would make is that uh, uh, we uh, we have two more events tomorrow with the Archbishop. At, at one thirty, he will uh, uh, answer questions about his new book on the Vatican in the Family of Nations, and that will cover the range of issues I think uh, uh, that he's been involved in and uh, that you might be interested in, including some that relate to, to education and future vocation for our students. Uh, uh, and then in the afternoon, he's another panel. 4.30. What time? 4.30. 4.30, 4.30. yeah. 4.30 on, um, uh, on, uh, on the question of refugees, in which he's been greatly involved in his whole career. So be aware of those events tomorrow as well. So, John? Well, 
today being the day the UN is designated to raise consciousness on this new treaty, and tomorrow's the day Pope Francis has wants to call attention, attention to uh, sharing the journey with ref refugees and the poor. Your, your, your statement towards the end uh, is just takes the wind out of us. A little short-term hope that this will be implemented. And yet you've spoken of education and the great need of education. You spoke of Episcopal conferences and the churches working locally with governments, working on the civil level. You spoke of the Holy See's role when situations arise. And we think of the classic one with John the 23rd, but also now you focused a little bit on North and South Korea. What else can the Holy See do rather than wait for something to come hot hawk? What can it really do diplomatically to see the implementation of this treaty? The, the Holy See has signed and ratified this treaty already. And uh, it encourages other countries to do the same. In fact, uh, uh, even some of the countries that are that have been uh, absent are encouraged to move in this direction through the sensibilization of their civil society. But uh, it will be a long process. The important thing, however, is that we now have a, a base, like for the other uh, weapons of mass destruction, chemical or biological, now we have for the atomic weapons, a uh, legal instrument that gives leverage to people working in this, in this field. Can we eventually bring into negotiations the nine countries that possess atomic weapons and the people depending on their umbrella approach? That is something that uh, we should work uh, toward. It will take time, it will take uh, effort, and uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty itself, which is the major treaty, uh, has a requirement in Article 6 for a total elimination of uh, atomic weapons. And the nine countries possessors of atomic weapons accept that treaty, participated in the enactment of that treaty even though it's not ratified yet by you all. And um, so we need to keep the door open and just keep working. Please join me in thanking our speaker. And you're welcome to join us in some refreshments and uh, Introduce yourself to the Archbishop if you'd like during that time. Thank you all. <laughs>